Hi, everyone. It's great to see some familiar faces. I see Diane. I haven't seen you in ages. Welcome, welcome. And Dina there and Tracy. Thanks so much for joining, Zach. So, um, Wendy's here. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> So we wanted to take a minute and um, first I wanted to say thank you so much for, for joining um, and taking the time out to come into our first Sphero um, virtual professional development um, event. And I wanted to say um, if you haven't, just a few things to make sure that you are muted, um, how you know you're muted is there's a little red microphone that has an X across it, and that's how you know you're muted. Um, and then if you do have any questions or something comes up, what we're doing for questions, just to give you a heads up, you know like how they're speed dating? Well, we're gonna be doing speed learning. Um, and what that means is, is that we have some wonderful key presenters, and they're giving you some packed full information um, within just a short amount of time. So enough to kind of get that pellet um, wet for you guys and, and make sure that you know have the basics. And if you wanna learn more, um, one of two things are gonna happen. You're gonna see that on the back um, of their presentation, they're gonna have their information. So you're more than welcome to reach out to them directly. Or we are going to be doing a survey at the end. And at the end, we're gonna be sending out the survey. It's going to uh, be coming from Sphero, probably um, one, of, you know, one of our familiar uh, survey platforms. And you're going to have the ability to ask some questions. And also you're gonna be um, having the ability to rate how you like this. Um, we may be doing uh, networking this way. You know, COVID has kind of a new way, a twist of, of us learning different ways to communicate. So um, we have right now the person who's going to be facilitating and have and hosting all of these different um, folks and keeping us on track is going to be John. So right now I'd like to kick this over to John Chapman. Um, John, are you there? Good morning, everyone. Good. Yes. Good. Thanks, Julene. Thank you. And and welcome everybody. It's great to have you all joining us this morning. My name is John Chapman. I serve on the Spiro board and have the pleasure of working with fantastic HR professionals from across the region. Um, I want to get us started right away and just a reminder uh, to mute yourselves so that uh, we can all hear effectively and so that so that our speakers can uh, present. So to get started this morning, we are going to start with Colleen Redshaw. Colleen Redshaw is the founder of Redshaw Solutions LLC. She's a certified executive coach who specializes in C-suite leadership development and training. She's also a senior executive consultant and senior partner with Center for Victory, which is a predictive index certified partner that specializes in employee assessments and talent optimization. This morning, Colleen is going to be leading us in a discussion or a presentation on leading through anxiety, inspiring others when you might be struggling yourself. So without further ado, Colleen. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, right, I'm, today I'm going to be speaking about leading through anxiety. So as return to work plans are implemented, leaders are trying to convince employees and colleagues that we will get through this crisis. But leaders are expected to be calm and in control. So how do they do this when they are actually terrified or just plain scared? So here are three questions from a recent Harvard Business Review article. First, how can you lead with authority and strength when you feel anxious? Two, how can you inspire and motivate others when your mind is racing? And three, if you hide the fear and attempt to be leaderly-like, where does it go? So in times of stress, many, how many of you actually just start pushing harder? So learning to accept anxiety and embrace that inner fear is a skill and it takes practice. So leaders should be thriving because of our emotions. But anxiety has a purpose. It's innately hardwired to protect us from harm. And anxiety is a reaction to stress, sometimes rational, sometimes not. It manifests as a feeling of being out of control. When leveraged appropriately, anxiety can actually motivate resourcefulness, is the best way to say it. 
and it can break down barriers and can create new bonds with teens. And anxiety that keeps us up at night can actually help us find creative solutions to complex business problems. However, if left unchecked, it, anxiety zaps our energy and it can drive us to make poor decisions. So years ago at a leadership workshop, the instructor said to embrace the tiger. Take fear and anxiety and embrace it to become a stronger and more effective leader. So leverage the fear into something good. But how do you do this? We do it by recognizing anxiety for what it is. And today in this upside down, topsy-turvy world of COVID-19 and recent events, let's address these three questions. So first, how can you lead with authority and strength when you feel anxious? You do it by being honest with yourself. Identify your anxiety. What are the triggers, the causes, and how does it impact your decisions? Know that the more you try to ignore and fight anxiety, the more it fights back. So the best way to deal with anxiety is to start with a healthy dose of self-awareness. And this makes you a better leader in any setting. So acknowledge that anxiety for what it is and firmly embrace the tiger. The dangers for some leaders is that when they react to anxiety, they do so by working harder. They hold themselves and others to an impossibly high standard. Their behavioral strengths go into overdrive and they respond to anxiety by trying to be more accurate and even more controlling. This can come across to team members as an unspoken panic and while the leaders are looking for the illusion of control. So second, how can you inspire and motivate others when your mind is racing? By taking action. Control what you can and let go of what you can't. If things are spiraling out of control, then work, on those th work first on those things that you can control. Identify what's possible from what's probable, and then separate out your worst possible fear from what's more likely to happen. So third, if you hide your fear in an attempt to be leaderly-like, where does it go? It follows you around until you acknowledge it. So what do you do? Try building a support system. So first, try to identify a support team consisting of people who you can be open and frank with, who listen. This team can include a coach, a mentor, a spouse, a partner, or friends, or develop an intimate peer group of professional leaders who commit to a, a confidential setting to discuss the anxieties, the difficulties surrounding COVID-19, and the economic fallout. And there are techniques for this process. Uh, the second part for building a support system is to practice well-being. Just set, simply let people know that your phone, texts, and emails are offline at 7 p.m. so you can spend quality time with friends and family. Try limiting your exposure to news by deactivating the constant Twitter and Facebook feed. And doing so is setting a good example for others, and it gives them permission to take care of themselves. And then third, contact a health professional through your EPA program, and NAMI is another source. So coping with skill is, an, is coping with anxiety is a skill to be learned and practiced. So I'll end by saying, give yourself a break. These are not normal times. Anxiety comes with being a leader. So leverage it to be a better leader and kind of embrace that inner tiger. Thank you. John, back to you. Great, thank you, Colleen, fantastic. Appreciate that, and we uh, just as a reminder, we we will be doing some kind of fun things too along the along the way today. We'll be having a group poll following our next speaker, um, and we will uh, we will also be doing a breakout session. So stay tuned for that. Um, next, we have a speaker. His name is. Sam Anderson, and Sam is the director of Washington EAP Services. He's been in the EAP field for 30 years, holds a master's degree, and is a certified leadership coach through Duquesne University. Is everybody still hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. I keep seeing some messages pop up. Um, sorry about that. So Sam, Sam's going to be joining us this morning and speaking about humble leadership 
uh, asking the right questions. And it will be a discussion on how humble leaders tend to ask the right questions. Sam, take it away. Thanks, John. Um, I hope everyone can hear okay. It's always a little awkward doing this kind of a presentation. Um, I've been studying leadership for the last 10 years, and also I've become a certified coach. And what I've really enjoyed about that experience is seeing the overlap. Sometimes you learn one thing and then you learn another thing and they conflict. But in this case, I'm seeing so much overlap and it's been, been very helpful. I know for me, I do coach individuals, but I've also tried to bring that coaching uh, presence into everything that I do. If, if I'm giving a presentation, I'm more likely to ask an audience today, what is it that you'd like to hear? Uh, if I'm meeting with staff, I'm more likely to ask open-ended questions. I'm less likely to tell and more likely to ask and more willing to say, I don't know. And so uh, the coaching and the leadership, I'm really seeing overlap. And I'm starting to look at a model where you find a leadership model that looks like coaching. And, and coaching, uh, you know, in general is a supportive relationship between uh, a coach and a client, uh, normally looking after the best interest or the goals, uh, hopefully the positive changes that the, uh, uh, the client would like to make. And then according to Joseph Ross, the definition of leadership is that it's an influence relationship between leader and follower. Again, looking for positive change and looking for uh, you know, mutual gains for both parties. What we seem to be reaching is a point where we're telling less, <laughs> we're demanding less, we're trying to include more, and, and how do we do that? So uh, for today, I just wanted to focus on two things. One is the idea of humility. And humility just seems to be coming up everywhere. You know, Patrick Lencioni talks about when you hire someone, hopefully they have humility. Uh, his definition of humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often, which I think is a really nice distinction. Uh, we certainly want leaders who know something, who have some sense of confidence or ego, but that they're not always putting themselves into the middle of things. Uh, Benjamin Zander, a great YouTube to watch if you have a moment. Uh, he's the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic and also a leadership expert. And he talks about uh, the idea that the conductor of an orchestra never makes a sound. It's the job of the leader to get the sound from the others. And one other quick YouTube you might like is David Marquis called Greatness. It's a short one. He's a, uh, a naval officer and he also learned to be humble, to ask more, to demand less, to see what other ideas or concepts the others have. So that's the humility piece. The question part is how do we ask good questions? John Maxwell wrote a book, great, uh, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And that really becomes a key to developing that relationship. So as I start to move toward my end, I wanted to primarily mention, well, I'll turn it the right side, how about that? Uh, well, I don't know what the right side is. It shows, shows backwards no matter what I do. Maybe I'm backwards, but it's uh, Edgar Schein, Humble Inquiry. Maybe some of you have seen it. But he talks about the different kinds of questions. One is humble. A humble question would be, how can I help you? What are your needs? What are your goals? How do you see this playing out? As opposed to confrontational questions, which as leaders we so often ask, well, how could you possibly do that? Uh, in a family situation, you could say, well, you know, uh, how could you flunk algebra? Uh, how could you date that person? And those aren't really questions, are they? They're really confront. There's a, there's a question mark at the end, but they're confrontational more. So Edgar Schein, who's just wonderful, uh, he likes the idea of an open question that it opens relationships rather than closes. It's asking rather than telling. And the other kind of question he likes is a process oriented question. As I close, just to say, I think we're at a good time right now for that kind of question. And that's simply, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? We're having this pandemic. We're having all of these social issues. How are we doing between each other? So those are the two things that leaders are less forceful. They're more humble. They're more open. Uh, they're more interested in the needs of their followers. Thank you, John.
Sam, thank you. Fantastic stuff. Really appreciate it. We're going to continue. And uh, again, special thanks so far to Colleen and Sam. Um, now we're going to move into our next speaker, who is Zach Bombach. Uh, Zach is a labor and employment attorney at Steptoe and Johnson's South Point office. He provides strategic advice to employers with respect to compliance with anti-discrimination and wage and hour laws, and he defends employers against claims brought under those laws. He also helps employers navigate the Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Act's application in the employment arena. And this morning, Zach is going to be sharing about navigating ongoing FFR CRA obligations as we return to work. So, Zach, thanks for joining us this morning, and glad you could be a part of it. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm also on the board of Sphero with John, so I'm really appreciative that we have the opportunity to connect virtually like this. Um, you know, some considerations in addition to the FFCRA are state discrimination laws and other federal discrimination laws that are in place. It's important to recognize that while we might be returning to work, maybe going back out to eat or having some uh, fewer restrictions as we go out and about in our daily lives, uh, the pandemic is ongoing and the FFCRA, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, while it's a temporary law, the statute and the temporary regulations from the Department of Labor will be in place through the end of this year, through December 31st. So those obligations with respect to emergency paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave, leave act uh, leave will also be available to employees to the extent that you as an employer are covered by the act and the employees as individuals are eligible for such leaves. So it's important to keep that in mind as we return to work. Uh, and keep in mind the guidance that we're getting from the Department of Labor. Uh, if you felt overwhelmed during this, you are not alone. Uh, I can say that as an attorney, many attorneys, if not all of us practicing in this area, have been overwhelmed by the ongoing and rapidly changing and sometimes unannounced guidance from the Department of Labor. Uh, there are a number, I think we're up to about 100 Q&As from the DOL on navigating the FFCRA. And just keep those complex issues in mind as everyone returns to work and continue evaluating those issues as we uh, continue throughout the year, not, not just through the summer, but also through the fall. And there's always a chance that we'll get new legislation, so, so keep that in mind. Some other considerations to think about, too, are the anti-discrimination laws that are currently in place and that have been in place for a long time. So what I'm thinking about is Title VII and the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act with respect to protected classes that are protected from discrimination. Keep those in mind as well as you go through the selection process for bringing employees back, whether you're asking them to come back or requiring them to come back. Come back. And as always, consult with your legal counsel before making a big decision about that, because as we've seen the Department of Labor enforce these laws, it really can be a domino effect if one poor decision leads to another. There may be multiple levels of potential exposure for employees who fail to comply with those laws. The, the traditional laws that we've had in place for decades and our new temporary law under the FFCRA. We've also had some very helpful guidance from the EEOC. I would say that the EEOC has provided a little bit more routine and certainly more announced guidance with respect to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you'll note that the EEOC has provided uh, a number of Q&As as well, most recently published on the 17th and updated on the 17th. They're saying that while under the ADA, it's very complicated to require a medical exam of employees, uh, given that we have a pandemic and there are a number of parameters uh, provided and recommended by the CDC, that temperature checks before coming into the workplace are okay. And even requiring uh, COVID-19 positive testing may be okay, uh, given the circumstances. Interestingly though, we noticed yesterday that they are not permitting employees, or at least saying it's not permissible for employees, for employers to require antibodies testing as a prerequisite for coming back. That's also tied to the CDC guidance with respect to the reliability and really the ability to determine whether or not that antibodies test proves anything. So again, a number of Q&As there to follow from the EEOC, similar to what we had with the DOL. Finally, one last thing to note is, as individuals come back to work, if they're only partially employed, they'll likely still be available or eligible anyway for unemployment compensation. Of course, the extra $600 a week is set to expire at the end of July. That may be enhanced or expanded throughout the end of the year. 
and keep in mind that that might uh, continue to increase as we uh, have certainly seen from Congress an additional discussion about further legislation with respect to UC benefits as well as the CARES Act. So of course, it's overwhelming. If you're overwhelmed, you're not alone. And of course, reach out to your legal counsel if you have any questions, but uh, take a look at those Q&As. They can be very helpful. That's all I have, John. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. Great information. And I know we're all thinking about those things right now. So really appreciate the input. Um, right now, before we jump into our next poll, we're going to hear from our next speaker, Vince Consoli. Uh, Vince, uh, in addition to bringing a lot of comedic relief to our board here at Spiro, uh, has for 38 years been leading, coaching, developing and encouraging people while serving in a variety of HR executive leadership roles. Vince currently serves as market president for Promark, a 50-year-old global firm that specializes in helping companies help their people in all stages of the talent life cycle. This morning, Vince is going to be sharing with us, engage now and be prepared for the future of talent management. Vince? Well, thanks, John. Uh, you don't have to do too much uh, watching the news to discover there's lots of stuff happening out there. A lot of fear and some uncertainty. And well, anyway, I got good news. This will end. It may look a little different when it's over, but it will end. There could be some more working from home or somewhere else, uh, more virtual meetings, masks, social distancing, among other things. Uh, we're not real sure what it's going to look like, but uh, one thing will remain, I can guarantee. Our businesses and organizations will still need highly engaged people. You know, automation has come a long way, but uh, people are still necessary to cast vision, lead, execute, and achieve goals. Uh, we can't tell how long this is going to last or ultimately what it'll look like, but we can focus on a few things that we can do, and we can do it now. And uh, might I add, uh, this is now the time for human resources professionals to lead the way in their organizations. There's many situations out there. Some companies have had to furlough employees, some permanent layoffs, uh, others have had to move empo employees away from the office or the facility. Management styles, meeting styles have changed or been modified to accommodate, uh, you know, the remote or combination workforces. So what should we do now? Well, one thing is for sure, we must communicate to keep people engaged. I don't care if they're working in the office still, working remotely, or even if they're furloughed and we want them back, we have to keep them engaged. So what do we communicate? Well, first, I think we should always say thank you. You know, uh, this is difficult. These are difficult times. Folks aren't exactly sure what they're doing necessarily, but we should thank them for their efforts and for, uh, you know, for dealing with this kind of stuff. I believe we should strongly communicate news, details of what's happening, because I come from the old school. If you don't tell them, they're going to make it up and then tell their friends. You know, that's how rumors get started. So, you know, and the other thing we should always do is ask questions. You need to know what people are thinking and feeling, your employees especially. You can't assume that you know what they're thinking and feeling. So guess what? You have to ask. You know, for example, a, a company that we know, it's a manufacturing facility, about 400 employees. They had to lay off 50 of them. They weren't sure if they were going to bring them back or not. They thought maybe they would, but they weren't sure. So they decided to do a full layoff, not a furlough. What they did do was they cut them off from everything right away. They chose not to offer outplacement or do severance or anything of that nature. Just give them the, you know, perp walk down the hallway and unceremoniously let them go. Well, let me tell you what happened. Within 10 days after letting 50 people go, 19 other employees were so up, well, all the employees were upset about how that happened. 19 of them quit. It's important how you do that. Their brand and their reputation were destroyed. Their previously good relationship with their employees was damaged and their future recruiting is adversely impacted. How you treat your employees now, no matter what, they're doing, working, working from home, furloughed, whatever, uh, will, will definitely impact recruiting goals, retention goals, customer service, revenue, and profit goals in the future. There will be a talent war. It's coming. There was one before all this stuff happened, and that one will continue. 
uh, and it's going to be even more intense after this is over. So as you engage with your employees, remember to ask questions, listen to what they're saying. If you're not sure what they're saying, ask another question, answer them, ensure the employees have heard you, respond to what you hear by coaching if it's necessary, executives, leaders, teams, individuals, revising policies, procedures, processes, workflow as needed, and providing necessary education, training, tools, and equipment. We gotta be ready to win this future war by engaging with employees now. So a quick summary uh, to a brief presentation, HR needs to lead the way. Care for your employees on the way in with great onboarding, on the way back with a good re-entry program from furlough or layoff, uh, whether they're, you know, while they're working, wherever they're, wherever they're working from, and uh, on the way out with some good outplacement assistance. This is not just something nice to do. It has real cost impact and, impact and saves your brand and reputation. Thanks for listening. John? Awesome, Vince. Thanks so much. Really good stuff. Appreciate you joining us and appreciate all your thoughts this morning. Um, we're going to continue on with our final two speakers, and I believe both of these folks are going to be sharing slides as well. Um, our next speaker is Erica Frischman. Erica is a senior consultant at Catalyst Connection. Many of you are probably familiar with that organization. Uh, they're the local manufacturing industrial resource center, providing consulting and training services to small manufacturers in southwestern Pennsylvania. In Erica's position as senior consultant, she specializes in helping manufacturers assess their business strategies and achieve their growth goals through innovation, operational excellence, and organizational development. This morning, Erica is going to be sharing with us on emotional intelligence. What is it and why is it even more important today? Erica, take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sphero, for this awesome opportunity and the ability to think outside the box in delivering professional development. So thank you very much. So today I wanted to, to give you a foundation on emotional intelligence. As we think about, leaders have 480 minutes. HR professionals and leaders, when I say 480 minutes, are like, oh, I wish my day was only 480 minutes, right? But every minute of that 480 minutes, we have communication, we have connections with folks, and we have the ability to further that connection, or we have the ability to take that connection off track. So as leaders, particularly today, uh, we need to recognize and understand that engaging the heart is just as critical as engaging the head, right? And what does that look like? And, and why is that even more important today? Well, this little thing called a global pandemic, right? Not so little when you think about people are now worrying about, you know, is my spouse going to lose their job? Do I have family members? How do I keep them safe and healthy, right? Is there going to be a second wave? I have to now work from home and be a teacher, right? And homeschool my child. How do I balance everything else in addition to um, what had my mind share beforehand? Because our normal has changed, right? As Vince told us, it will be gone different, right? The pandemic will go away, but what will normal look like moving forward? So when you hear emotional intelligence, you know that to set the stage, emotional intelligence is the ability to manage yourself and your relationships with others so that you can truly live your intentions, to be humble, to be authentic, to connect that head and heart as you engage your employees, as you engage your peers. So what makes for success? Uh, Daniel Goldman did a great study from his perspective. Emotional intelligence is how you handle yourself and how you handle relationships. So when you look at jobs in general, 
you can be successful 33% of the time just with IQ and technical skills. EQ will lead to 66%. When we think about leaders in particular, look at that change in that statistic, right? 15% of your success is dictated by your IQ and technical skills in 85% of how successful you will be as a leader is determined based on your emotional intelligence. The great thing is you can not change your IQ, but you can change your EQ, and that will help you be a more successful leader, HR professional, worker in general, right? So when we think about emotional intelligence, there's two components to that. The first is the focus on myself as an individual. Do I have the ability to be aware of my own personal feelings in my mood and what impacts that, right? So do I notice a connection between my mood and how I interact at work? Do I reflect on my emotions after an event to better understand my reaction. I have to have that self-awareness first to be able to and balance that with the focus on others, right? So do I have the ability to empathize with and recognize emotional cues? So what can I do? What do I have to be mindful of? Well, you have to balance that heart and head. You have to think about people's personal needs and their practical needs. The personal needs are their human needs, what they bring to the conversation, right? And the practical needs is what you actually need to get accomplished. So balance that heart in that head. Hearing versus listening, right? We all can hear, but do we really listen? big difference. Do we put our phones away and are we engaged? So as we wrap up today, what is that thing you are going to commit to to be more successful as a leader? What will you be more mindful of from the emotional intelligence perspective and improving your emotional intelligence through deliberate practice? If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, John. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Erica. Great stuff. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to move to our last speaker this morning, who is Beth Davis. Beth is the founder of the Llewellyn Group and Loop, where she gets to work with companies serious about creating workplaces that do good with and for many. She's a pioneer in the agile HR movement and is one of only a select few in the US certified to teach and certify others in the IC Agile Agility and HR certification. She's also a licensed Scrum trainer and Scrum at Scale pr practitioner. In addition to her work, Beth is a member of the Sphero Advisory Board, hosts a podcast called In The Loop, co-leads the Pitt Agile community, and is a volunteer item writer for the HRCR SPHR exam. This morning, Beth's going to be sharing with us creating a truly agile culture. Beth? Thanks, John. Boy, that makes me sound busy <laughs> as I listen to you say it. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for letting me be here today. And, and uh, as it works out, everything that the other presenters um, have talked about, I'm going to try to weave it all into this conversation about creating a truly agile culture. And I think a lot of times uh, when people hear the word agile, they think it's all about being faster or um, in the in the true sense of the word it's just for product development and what i want to share with you today is how in any of our jobs we can really create a culture that deals with the vuca world that we live in and i i love vuca as an acronym because i think hr professionals in particular are so well versed to understand how volatile how uncertain how complex and how ambiguous uh, work can be and, and the world can be, and just the complexity of, of working with people, um, being able to see that, quite frankly, 
you know, you might think you have a plan to create a great workplace culture, to deliver value to your customers, to um, get things done. But in reality, and as, as the recent uh, past has shown us more than ever, uh, reality, it, it doesn't care about your plan. Um, and so when you're in an agile uh, mindset and organization, you're able to deal with the reality and inspect and adapt based on what you know is true today. And I think a lot of the companies who have pivoted very easily, not maybe seamlessly into different ways of working during the recent uh, recent events over the last couple of months, it's because they were able to deal with their reality. And in organizations that see themselves as social systems, not as a machine. Um, so if you think about Taylorism, bringing scientific management practices forward, um, if we start to really shift and think about our organizations as the social systems that we know they are, how can we actually empower people uh, to help us deal with these uncertain times? So instead of us feeling the pressure um, to get it all right and have all the answers from an HR perspective, how can we share that with others so that we actually get a better answer and more engagement? And oh, by the way, it helps with our anxiety um, as Colleen mentioned, because as leaders, we don't have to have all the answers, right? We can actually tap into the wise crowds that we work with. Um, but a lot of organizations and people still um, still don't see people through the lens of, of theory X, or still see it through theory X versus theory Y. So many, many decades ago, McGregor wrote a book around um, workplaces and most people would say, if I ask them, I, I see people as why, right? I'm a why person. I want to be seen as interested in my work and uh, responsible and all that. But in reality, I see everybody else on the left-hand side, which is, you know, people generally don't like work and they're lazy and they're only motivated by job security and money and, you know, not seeing people as, as capable adults and responsible adults. And you think about dealing with complexity, that that goes right to it, right? If we don't see people through that lens. So what does this have to do with an agile culture? Modern agile mindset, right? Let alone practices that we get to do is, is really four things. Um, delivering value continuously. Is what we're working on valuable to who, right? Is it value to our customer, is it valuable to our people? Safety is a prerequisite and not just physical safety, but psychological safety. Experimenting and learning rapidly. So making short-term goals, and seeing what happens. And then last but not least, making people awesome, right? And, and one thing I wanna offer the group, and I'm gonna send this in the chat, John, after we're done, um, in the work I do with Agile People, we do a lot around psychological safety, right? And psychological safety is, is very much about, is it safe to be myself? Is it safe to say I don't know? Is it safe in this environment to speak up, right? And so if someone is psychologically safe but really not motivated, you get vacationers, right? Um, if I'm not safe, but I'm very motivated and accountable, that's where we get burnout. And so what I'll send to the group is we have an online psychological safety game that you can actually use with your folks um, and talk about what's our environment like? How is it going for us here? How do we make our environment more safe to be able to deal with that resiliency? And then to grow the culture, um, remove those limiting structures from HR, finance, and other areas. Yes, limit risk for the company, but let's increase support to allow people to start working with some new behaviors and keep going. And the kind of people that you're looking for in your companies that will help you grow this kind of culture is all about those who collaborate, ask for help, willing to take small steps, willing to do something good enough for now that are adaptable, and they're willing to work outside their expertise. And the thing is, it's all about forming new habits. Uh, you can go much deeper into how to actually do this, um, but really it's about trying out new things, new behaviors, and eventually you could do this in your companies. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, we'll also send the psychological safety game out to you. And to me, these are the things that tying it all together is about seeing people as responsible and capable and helping you create an amazing workplace culture. Thanks. Awesome, Beth. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to just close with uh, thanking everybody uh, for joining us this morning. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm sure that at least one, uh, hopefully all, of the speakers prevented, presented some things that really are mindful and um, are helpful for you and your organizations. Um, so personally, I want to thank you for joining us. I do want to toss it back to Juleen, who has some closing remarks. Uh, Juleen, take it away.
Well, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I This is our first time doing this, and um, I just really, wow, I'm just wowed. Even though the, the sessions were small, they were they were so informative and impactful. Um, thank you to all the speakers. You guys are phenomenal, phenomenal. I am so blessed that we have you guys. Um, not only a lot of you guys serve on our board, but uh, honestly, my mind is just like spinning right now and um, just so many ways. So, um, so thank you to the presenters. You guys are, are awesome. And thank you for the people who were attending. We are going to be sending out that survey. Um, we hope that you really like the format. We hope that you got some good stuff from it. Um, if you did like it, then please feel free to share this uh, with, with us in the questionnaire. And then whenever you have the opportunity, share it with people who, um, you know, we're here to help HR um, and we're here to give them guidance. That's, you know, we come together. So that's our, that's our mission. So if you really liked it, um, please, you know, open it up to the floodgates and share this content and Spiro with, with your, you know, colleagues. Um, we greatly appreciate it. So again, look for that survey. Um, we were talking about, you know, something's gonna, we had something on the books for July 23rd. Um, that's what was our normal kind of schedule. We'll keep you posted on what's going on. Um, thank you to the chamber. They really helped um, the executive producers of this. Just Vince for, for putting this together and John for like, just everybody, just everybody. So thank you so much. Have a blessed day and we'll talk to you guys later. Enjoy.